This podcast is sponsored by nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming the beautiful, the talented, Lynn Eastman Rossi. Now, you all may remember her. She was Sally in Don Coscarelli's 1979 immortal horror cult classic Phantasm. Celebrating its 45th anniversary, she'll be my third guest from that movie. And I cannot wait. I wanted to reach out to her years ago, but I don't know why I didn't. But just recently, I was like, oh, God, it's going to be the 45th anniversary of Phantasm. I got to get somebody for a minute. And I thought, why not Lynn Eastman? That is so friggin' awesome. And um, she's also been in some Jonathan Kaplan movies like Heart Like a Wheel, Project X, and Immediate Family and stuff like that. Her and her husband, Leo Rossi, they have a production company. And I'm going to ask more about that. And um, she was also in the, the underrated horror classic Night of the Demon. Not Night of the Demons, but Night of the Demon from 1980. And I'm looking forward to this conversation. It's going to be so friggin' awesome. And uh, my dad's been here for two days, and I'm so glad. We've been listening to Mark Barron's podcast, and he's been enjoying it. I got him to watch Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and he really enjoyed that. And life is good. Things are good. And it only gets better. So yeah, here is my interview with Lynn Eastman Rossi. Hey, Tommy. Hey, Lynn. Welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm good, and thank you for having me. I, I'm, I'm excited to talk to you. First of all, I love your name. Tell me, is it Kovac? Kovac, yeah. No S at the end. <laughs> and it sounds like... You know, I don't know. You should have your own podcast. <laughs> I do have. And you do. And you do. I know. Tell me, Kovac. Yeah. I never um, met a Kovac before. So. Yeah, people ask me all the time if I'm related to Ernie Kovacs, and I'm like, I don't have an S at the end. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so, what 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 kind of name is that? What is your lineage? Uh, my dad is Croatian. That's where it comes from. Oh, beautiful. That's a beautiful country. Yeah, uh, fortunately, there's not much written about it or told about it, but, um, yeah, <laughs> Croatian. Yeah, it's across, uh, the sea from Italy, which, uh, I'm an Italian citizen. Um, oh, my it, mom's Italian. Yeah, my husband's half Italian, half Irish, and we went through that whole process of, you know, our, his lineage to be able to get citizenship, um, so that was interesting, you know. They, yeah. they didn't keep track of uh, your birth unless you went to church. Uh, the church, we couldn't find his grandmother's birth certificate, so we had to hire somebody to go to the church in Bogadia, Sicily, to go through the records to find her birth certificate. <clears throat> so anyway, it was a long journey, and now we have our citizenship. So, you know, if we don't like what's happening here in the States after this election, we'll just um, have to use our citizenship and maybe go move to Europe somewhere. Yeah, oh, I hope you don't have to do that, but I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> yes, yes. So are you, did you find me from Phantasm, or? Um, oh, yeah, I've been, yeah. I, I love that movie, you know, most of my life and stuff, and... I got to tell you, I, I, I cannot tell you what a great honor this is. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, of course. I mean, I love the fans, you know. And I came late to the party because, well, well I guess let's just start here. I was going to start <laughs> way back, but let's just start here. Um, so I grew up in Long Beach. Mm -hmm. and, um, my father was a rancher, and, yeah. and he... He met my mother, who was a city girl from York, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And so there was the city guy meets, you know, the country guy meets the city girl. And so it was interesting growing up that way, because I love what they both gave me. I mean, my father used food as medicine because there were no doctors around. Yeah. And my, my mother was a health food met. So I grew up 
I was the kid that had to stay in class while everybody else went to get their measles shots or whatever, mm -hmm. all the vaccinations, because my parents just felt that I didn't need it, that food was my medicine. So, um, obviously, it's about building your immune system, and so I, I've just been very fortunate in that way. My mother saw something in me. I, I'm the youngest of three. Mm -hmm. And she put me in ballet class and singing classes, and she was a musician herself, so we would sit down at the piano, she would play, and I would sing. And um, so I always wanted to be in musicals, and that's where my journey started, was um, mm. I was Alice in Alice in Wonderland, you know, yeah. a kid's show. And then my best friend's mother was the music director for the Long Beach Civic Light Opera. And so they needed some kids for this show called Take Me Along. So we, I started in at 12, being just, you know, in the background. And mm -hmm. we had people like um, Martha Ray and Howard Keel. And, yeah. and, you know, big people that would come from Hollywood to Long Beach because was, they were really professional shows. So it was, um, it was just magical. And I eventually worked my way up to play Lori in Oklahoma. It was Anna and the King and I. My favorite was to play Nancy and Oliver. Yeah. I'll never forget having the stage to myself. I was sitting on the London Bridge singing As Long As He Needs Me. I don't know if you know the play, but... That doesn't sound familiar. <laughs> she's, in a bad, she's in a bad relationship, and um, he, he beats her, and she puts up with it, and, um, and then she sings As Long As He Needs Me. I'll, I'll be there, basically. And mm -hmm. just having that time on the stage with just me and the audience, it's so intimate. Um, so I've always just been a creative spirit, and out of that, I was offered to, a, to be a, a lead singer in a band. Yeah. And um, it was originally for a competition. The Press-Telegram, which is a local newspaper, was holding a local band competition. But it turned into a relationship with a guitar player, and we started to band. We called it first. We were the soda pop singers because we were too young <clears throat> to yeah. play in bars. So they let us be in the bars, but we'd have to leave at intermission because we were underage. Wow! And then we went to Bit of Honey, and I went by Honey at that time, and we were doing shows up and down the coast. And then we started writing our own music, Sassy Smash. That was the name of our group. Right. And uh, we put all our money together to buy recording equipment. My parents let us take over the garage. One thing led to another. The guitar player, his name's Paul Ritajic, uh, ended up having a real talent for sound. He's the kind of guy every band meets because he was such a perfectionist mm -hmm. of getting the, the right sound. So long story short, we were so in debt from all the equipment, we had to start renting the studio out to pay for the equipment. And we had groups like Rain, and we had um, Michael Nesmith found out about us. Yeah. From the Monkees, of all things. And he, had, he was doing concept albums. We recorded his album. RCA Records found us out about this hot little studio in Long Beach, and they sent us a one of their new artists, a guy named David Britton. But that yeah. wasn't my my dream my dream was to pursue acting and so but this is how phantasm happened because we had the recording studio in long beach and don coscarelli lived in long beach yep and reggie bannister who is this, basically the star of the phantasm movies yep i've had him on yeah he's a wonderful guy yeah. and a very um grounded spiritual guy and he Went, was um, a musician with my mother at, at the local church. And so they were talking one day, and Reggie was telling her about this movie and how, you know, they were looking for a recording studio. And she goes, well, my daughter has a recording studio in our house. And by then we had expanded. They let us take over the family room, which was at, the entrance was at the carport. So people could park in our circular drive and they didn't have to bother the house, the main part of the house. They could come in through the car park, and we called it the Recording Suite, S-U-I-T-E. <laughs> so uh, Reggie set up an appointment with my mom to come bring Don to see the studio, and that's how I met Don Coscarelli. Mm -hmm. And before he left, he loved the studio. He says, we definitely want to record here. 
he said, he looked at me and he said, do you want to be in the movie? And I was like, sure. You know, I just thought, that'd be fun. Yeah, it's just going to be a, you know, a fun movie. And I was Miss Long Beach at the time. Mm-hmm. So I was living this kind of double life of this music. Uh, we'd be up at midnight. We wouldn't get up until, you know, mm-hmm. 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, yeah. And uh, <laughs> the life of a musician. And then being um, Miss Welcome to Long Beach, where I was opening hotels and breaking champagne bottles over bows of, of ships and welcoming, you know, foreign dignitaries and yeah. riding in parades. I've, I've had quite quite an incredible life. Even there's so much more that I'm leaving out, but um, the good stuff is definitely it gets, it gets better. So we, we we filmed the movie, and his mother was hair and makeup and wardrobe. His father was the producer on the set. Uh, it was really just the family of all local actors and. Um, it was special. Yeah. I wasn't, I was obviously, I had uh, scenes with Don Thornberry where he's dating my sister and he comes over and I'm in a, a little uh, baby doll nighty. And mm-hmm. then I, I, I said to Don, I said, what, what is that scene about? Are you trying to cause trouble between my sister and me? And he laughed. And so a lot of the stuff that I was in was cut because it wasn't part of the main storyline. Right. I mean, that would have taken the movie in a whole other direction. And so I kind of um, just, when the movie was finished, I, I didn't really think it was going to ever become anything. You know, I just, yeah, yeah it was so low budget. And so I moved on and moved to Hollywood, uh, signed up at the Lee Strasberg Theater Institute, and um, started studying serious method acting. Was there for five, six years, and then moved on to um, other other teachers as well, and started auditioning. I was supporting myself by commercials, and um, I was a DJ at a nightclub called Zeno's, mm-hmm. which was at the Sheraton Hotel uh, near the airport. Interesting. And, um, so uh, that was fun because I I had a, a trippy time sitting up in this booth. And it was like, when you have control of the music, you can totally transform the room from being mellow, yeah. somber, or romantic, or dance music, you know. And um, so that that was a, a good job to have, except it paid well. But I was, you know, I got off at 2 o'clock in the morning. And so one night I was driving home, and this is the... the not a good part of L.A., and I was at a stop sign, and mm. this guy ran into the back of me oh. at 2 o'clock in the morning. And uh, luckily, I got out, and I was pissed, mm-hmm. and he got out, and he was incoherent, basically. And I looked, and I said, just my tail light's broken. I'm not even going to deal with this guy, because I don't even want to deal with anybody that's that out of their mind. So I just said, never mind, I got back in the car and I drove off. But um, the perils of being a single woman in Hollywood or something. Um, so, any questions that you have that you want to, need to go or shall I just keep rambling? I've, I've got <laughs> so many. So, oh, going back to what you were saying before about uh, doing the, the the civic opera, uh, when you're working with like Howard Keel and Martha Ray, did they did they like you know mentor you in any way? Yeah, they did. I mean, just their very presence, and it was more of just an observation of, uh, and and they they said you know this this is a lifestyle, you know, and it, and when you go on the road with a show, it's hard to be in a relationship. Because mm-hmm. you're traveling all the time now. This Long Beach Civic Art Opera didn't go on the road, but people that do those kinds of traveling shows, that's where you really can make some good money. But you know, it's your it's your life now. You're you're going from hotel to hotel, different theaters all the time. Mm-hmm. And so that wasn't really anything I was it was interested in. I was more about um, I just grew up watching these 
incredible actresses. My mother loved all the old movie stars, you know? Yeah. Um, Catherine Hepburn and Lauren Bacall. And, oh, yeah. I mean, some of these, these just um, Vivian Lee. Yep. And uh, so I always, and also Sarah Fawcett was coming up. Well, she was already a, a big star by the time I was coming up. But yeah. People laughed at her, you know, and I, I was tall and blonde and I didn't want people to laugh at me. I wanted to, I didn't want to audition for anything until I knew what I was doing, until I felt like I had, you know, some, some craft. Right. You know. When you when you studied with Strasberg, uh, what did he teach you that you never forgot? Well, he would only come in the summers, and I was work study, so uh -huh. he, I was his secretary. And so um, it's interesting because he would be really open and friendly with people when they're in class and me. But if you saw him outside on the street or in the office, it was... He did, doesn't talk to anybody. He just kept to himself. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a sort of a protection thing because people, you know, he was, he mentored Marilyn Monroe. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, Robert De Niro. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he was the go-to guy for the, these, these big stars. So, but it didn't matter. I didn't care about that. But he had uh, all the work-study people over to his house. His wife, uh, Anna, was there. But what he taught me was that I am more powerful than I know. And he said that 99% of your performance comes from listening. That if you're thinking about what your next line is, or if you're thinking about, is there something on my shirt? And you're not listening to the other actor, you're mm -hmm. missing out on the moment, you know, of creating any kind of reality in the scene. Right. You, know, you have to hear everything. You have to take everything in from that that actor. And and I also learned that because one time I was backstage and I they kept, he kept putting me off like I was supposed to enter and then he started talking to the class and he goes okay Lynn you know get ready and then he started talking again and this went on for probably twenty minutes. Yeah. So I started really getting mad, you know. <laughs> but in the scene I was supposed to be mad. So what, what I learned was to use whatever's happening, you know, because you can't just shut it off. Right. You know, you have to learn how to channel things and mold them into your performance because people can tell when you're, you're just dialing it in. You know, we've seen bad actors before. Yeah. <laughs> we've seen actors that are fully present. Right. And, and it's real, you know, and it's mm -hmm. moment to moment. So much of acting is life. You know, we get our cues from people moment to moment in life. And um, and listening is a big thing in life, too, isn't it? Uh, yes, Especially it is. In, in, in your job. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I want to find out more about, about how, you, how you got to where you're at with this podcast. I know it's... Um, how many... Interviews have you done now? Uh, in a couple, in, in a day or so, it'll be 2,200. Wow. So this has been a real journey for you. Seven years, so yeah. How many years? Seven years. Seven years. Congratulations. That's, that's quite you. an accomplishment. It is. Is it, is it fun to go back and hear the old ones? Not really. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I just. So tell me what you've learned. I was just God. I was just a baby when in the beginning. The way I the way I sounded, I was just like I just I. It's like I I don't say I don't think I was starstruck, but I was just so nervous. Like I was afraid of a million different things. I remember Marlon Brando was on the Dick Cavett show, and he told Cavett like what his job entails, even though he's never done it. He says, "You're you have a million things going through your head. Is this person amused? Is this person offended? Is it time for a joke now? Is it time for a commercial?" It's like that's what <laughs> the kind of things that are going through my head uh, during an interview. That's what. Was was going on in the early ones uh, especially right. now you know it's like a second language to me I don't worry as much as I used to that's good yeah you just relax right right we're just talking here that's all we're just talking we're just talking but I know you probably want to hear more about my phantasm experience 
Yeah. Oh, before we get there, I wanted to ask you, when you were in Strasberg's class, like, who were some of your classmates that later went on to become successful in acting? Oh, it's interesting. Well, Amy Madigan and Michelle Pfeiffer was um, actually in Milton Gonzalez's class with me. I know I know Michelle's uh, sister, Dee Dee. She's been on twice. Yeah, yeah. And um, let's see, well, Ken Lerner introduced me to my husband. Um, he's... Uh, He's a character actor. Oh, yeah, he's great. I almost had him on a few years ago. Yeah, his, his uh, brother, Michael Lerner, passed away just uh, two years ago. Yeah. But Michael uh, was nominated for Academy Award, and Ken still works all the time. Um, and so does my husband. I mean, he's on the set right now in um, Brooklyn filming Graves End, which is an Amazon Prime series mm -hmm. that you can watch. This is season three. And it has um, Chaz Palminteri, my husband Leo Rossi, yeah. um, Fran Drescher, Natasha oh. uh, Shire, um, Armand Asante. Oh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just an incredible cast. And now this season, they brought Shaq on. Yeah. <laughs> so that's amazing, because William DeMeo, who's the creator, director, writer, star of the show, mm -hmm. probably my height, he's probably about 5'8". Yeah. And he has scenes with Shaq, who is, what is Shaq, eight feet? Or almost. Probably. <laughs> so it, it looks like, <laughs> it's like half the size of, of Shaq, so. I'm 6'3", he'd be bigger than me, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He'd make you look like a peanut, even. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, think he's, I think he's almost eight feet. But, um. Yeah, so when, um, when you got the script, for Phantasm. I can't imagine you were a horror fan before, but did you, like, you know, recognize the brilliance of the script? Well, the script kept changing. Oh. Um, you know, this was the very first one, and so Don was young, and, and he had these ideas, and this came from a dream. And he kept adding things or subtracting things. He didn't quite know what to do with um, me and Susan, who was my, played my sister, mm -hmm. I became the babysitter of Michael, and um, my sister was supposed to be dating um, Dawn. I mean, yeah. 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 So, so yeah. anyway, it was kind of, and it, it turned out in a way where people know that they're watching a dream, a, a nightmare, because it doesn't, if you really try to make sense of it, it, it's like a dream where things happen and all of a sudden somebody comes, you know, reaching their hand out or the, the silver balls and these dwarves that are, you know, raiding this mortuary and, and the lady in lavender and uh, the, the scene where I'm in the Volkswagen driving, um, trying to, you know, save Michael because they're after him. Yeah, there's the, um, the, the unknown lurker. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Oh, man, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so it was basically we were in a warehouse and they had this old Volkswagen and they had it on springs. And so you had Don, Don the director, on one, the front, and then you had Paul Pepperman, the producer, at the back. Mm -hmm. They were rocking, rocking it. So I'm trying to drive and it's supposed to be like we're being attacked by all these dwarves and... Um, and I wasn't moving at all. <laughs> it was just the same place. They were just rocking the, rocking the car. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so. And Did... then there was the thing where, where we are alive or dead. So we had, he had to add this line at the end where they said, um, are, you know, how are Sally and Susan? And, and they said, oh, I saw them running across the field. So I think they're safe. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised uh, they never asked you to be back uh, for the sequels. I mean, it, I mean, it appeared that you survived. Well, what happened was that there was a breakup in the relationship, mm -hmm. and I moved to Hollywood. Uh. And so, and Paul, who was the guitar player in the band, and then you know, we built the studio together. We went all the way to Westlake Audio, who designs recording studios, to find out how how we could build a drum booth in a garage, you know, because he needed to isolate the different instruments. And I, um, I mean, he's incredibly talented. I'm actually going on a yacht cruise this Saturday. On He's he's a captain now, mm -hmm. and he's married um, this lovely lady named Michelle. 
Mm-hmm. And we just we met in high school, so we just had a high school reunion. Nice. I haven't seen him in years. And um, so he invited us on, on his uh, yacht, so that'll be fun. Oh, Angus Grimm looked genuinely intimidating and scary, was he? <laughs> um, I loved that man. He was so gentle. Mm-hmm. And it, when you talked to him, it was like you were the only person in the world, and everyone felt that way. Um, yeah, he wasn't at all scary. In fact, he had that voice, right? Mm-hmm. Incredible voice. And he was like a Royal Academy trained actor. Right. Who was not doing these kinds of roles at all. And so Don, Don was working with him on, um, what was that? The kid show, Kenny and Company. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he was playing a, um, a, a teacher. Mm-hmm. And, and that's how Don saw him. You know, it's just this man who very straight, with a great voice, and authority, which was needed for the role. He he had he had that he had that Christopher that Christopher Lee like presence you know. Yes, absolutely. And so Don had kept him waiting. It was getting later and later and later. And so then it was like, oh, we can't we can't do, you know, Angus stuff tonight. So he goes in and he says, "I'm sorry, buddy." He said, "It's just too late. We're gonna have to." And Angus goes, "What do you mean?" <laughs> Don knew. Yeah. He's never thought of him as a tall man, ever. Yeah. And when he used that voice with that kind of projection, with that scary voice, <laughs> I was like, I've got my, I've got my guy here. I've got my tall man. So that's a great story. But yeah. I came on board. So, you know, when Paul and I broke up, it was right after they had finished the recording, but they were still now having to match it to the, you know, to the um, movie. Yeah. And so suddenly I disappear, and I'm sure, you know, Paul was upset, and I was upset. I mean, breakups are hard. Yeah. And so, of course, Don never told me this, but I didn't talk to Don for many, many years after that. Um, And it was just because I was busy. I was in Hollywood, and I was studying, and I was auditioning, and, you know, doing the actor thing. Mm-hmm. So um, when I finally got a call, well, no, actually my daughter was then a teenager, and she went with some friends to the Hollywood Cemetery to see a whole scary movie on Halloween. Mm-hmm. And I had told her about Phantasm in my recording studio, and you know, you talk to your kids about your, you know, what's happened in your life. Yeah. And so she comes home and she said, Mom, you can't believe that the movie was Phantasm and that they had a whole panel up there. It's like, your movie's a cult classic, Mom. Your movie is a cult classic. I was like, (laughs) really? You're kidding me. Really? Then I started getting the calls for these signings. And it was great because Leo was in Halloween, too. Mm -hmm. And so we have the same... um, agent that books us and he books us together now because people want our pictures together they, when they find out yeah and um and so it's fun we have a good time right? we're going to the scare fest in lexington uh, kentucky the end of october well, we've done the monster of Palooza, you know we've done yep oh you know several of them and, and i i just love the fans i mean i i love that they love this movie mm-hmm and many of them love this movie, this Phantasm, better than any of the other Phantasms. And I think it was because when you have a small budget, you have to get creative. You have to figure out ways to make that silver ball fly oh, yeah. across the room, you know. And you have to figure out how you're going to do these special effects. And there's something cool and magical about it, you know. You mm-hmm. just have to find your way. Um, when you get bigger budgets, then, you know, you can use the special effects. And, so, and I haven't even seen the other Phantasms, so I, I can't really judge myself. Yeah, they're, they're they're okay, but the original to me is a classic. I mean, I I remember when the second one came out because Universal released it and, it and it got all these previews. That's how I first became aware of a Phantasm as a kid, and I saw the um, the first one a little bit later in life and just fell in love with it because I just love those those seventies grindhouse looking you know horror films. Yes, and did you relate to Michael? 
character, Michael Baldwin. Oh yeah, and you know, I just, I just love, I just love like the, the, uh, the low budget containment of, of of the films and that film and just the the way they look and. You know, when I got to meet everybody um, in 2019 at Monster Palooza, that was that was the first time in in, in the, the cons history that I'm aware of where they had so many heavy hitters that weekend. They had to have extra rooms for everybody because they had Adrian Barbeau that weekend. They had a lot was of that the one in, people. In Burbank? This was the Burbank one, yeah, yeah at I the was, Marriott. I was there, and they brought the 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 uh, Hertz out. Did you see that with the purple velvet interior? Yeah. That was in the movie. Yeah, yeah, I was there. That was the first one that I actually went to was uh, in 2019. But I don't remember you guys signing unless I... I unless... Well, they, you know, Gigi started this whole thing with the women of Phantasm, and so that's when she contacted me. And Oh, yeah, the women with balls, right? <laughs> yes, yes. And so they had a panel with us on stage, and they interviewed each one of let each one of us talk about yeah, I didn't get to go to the, to, to the panel, but like, yeah, I got to, I got to meet everybody except what's his name who just died, the old man um, yeah. who died recently. Thanks. Ken, right? Is that his name? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he, yeah, he ended up canceling. And, um, are you familiar with Dick Warlock? Well, he's from Halloween. Oh, yeah, Dick Warlock. I never met him, but I know who he is. Yeah, yeah, he's good friends. So, you know, because I, he does all the, he was the original that man for the Halloween for Michael Murphy. Michael um, Myers. <laughs> Michael Myers, but not Michael Murphy. But um, <laughs> <laughs> that's quite a difference. Michael Myers. There's still been so many Michael Myers now. Oh yeah, a lot of yeah, them. A lot of them. But this is this uh, this sweet little film. I mean, recently Don and, and his wife invited us over to be with some um, who was all there. There was just about um, Kate Lester was there and Cat uh, Lester, Murray and yeah, a bunch of us. Um, and his wife is a beautiful vegetarian cook, and she made some delicious vegetarian food. <laughs> and he lives; he's got a beautiful home and family, and um, he's doing really well. So that's awesome. Uh, yeah. When the movie finished, uh, did you guys have like a rap party and a screening? Well, by then I was out of there. Okay. So I think, you know, Don probably felt some kind of alliance with Pa. You know how when people break up, it's like, you know, who do you, can you stay friends with both of them? And I wasn't making any effort because it was just, right. I wanted to get on with my life. You know, this was not what I intended because we owed so much money that I was singing background on other people's music or answering the phones and going, this isn't how I planned my life to be, you know. Yeah. But for Paul, it was what he loved. He ended up really loving being a recording engineer, and he went on to um, do ground control studios in Venice. Mm -hmm. And then he now has Mercury Sound in Glendale. And what's so interesting is that my husband did a film, and I forget which one it was. Was it the Relentless film? But... You know, he had known my history with Paul, and that I had this recording studio in Long Beach and all. Um, so they do, Paul's now doing movie soundtracks. Nice. And, and Foley work. So little did Leo, my husband, know that his movie was being done at Mercury Sound, which was Paul's studio. So I didn't put two and two together because, you know, I, I was not paying attention. So it comes time for the screening um, for the cast and crew, and <clears throat> Leah's sitting down, and I had gone to get some water, and I came walking down the aisle to my seat, and I hadn't seen Paul in probably seven years. Mm -hmm. And who comes walking towards me was, you know, we were together for seven years, too. So <laughs> it's this very familiar face. We built a recording studio together. We had a band together. We were living together. We had a dog together. I mean, it was like we were married, but we weren't. I see this very familiar face, and it's Paul. Oh. And I had no idea he had was doing movie soundtracks. <laughs> and I was like, Paul. Oh. And I'm, to myself, I'm going, wow, he looks older. <laughs> <laughs> and then in the back of my mind, I'm going, he's probably looking at me and going, wow, she looks older. Because we, we got together.
when we were 17. Yeah. So we were now in our 30s, so that's quite quite a, quite a long time. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so now life is good. You know, uh, life goes on. Um, I have no regrets in my life. I, I think uh, I've learned a lot, I have to say. And I think it's all about following your bliss, which is a Joseph Campbell quote, to follow your bliss. Right. You know? And do what makes you happy. And I think you're doing that, Tommy. I am. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you're in the right place. And, uh, you know, and, and as you get, just the longer you do it, the better you get. I mean, it's, it's, it's called um, an, uh, an outlier. Mm-hmm. You need to become an expert is uh, at least 10,000 hours in what, whatever you're chosen. Right. After uh, you did Phantasm, you did another horror movie, Night of the Demon. Yeah, that was, I was in school and somebody saw me do a scene and they said, you want to be in a movie? And, I, and so it was another one of those kind of things. And I had d- done some commercials with Michael Cutt, mm-hmm. who um, they played the, my husband in that movie. Um, but oh, and then when I worked with Kurt Russell, uh-huh. on Unlawful on, on Entry with Ray Liotta and Madeline Stowe, yeah. um, I had a scene with him that uh, caught cut. Um, because it wasn't part of the main... So it was interesting because I had a conversation with, with Kurt in between takes, and I had told him about um, Project X. I, 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 I got to tell you, I, I cannot stand that movie. It's so sad. <laughs> I know, I know. And I was Sergeant Huntley. I was on the team that was trying to change, yep. you know, train the chimpanzees. I love Heart Like a Wheel, though. That movie... Oh, that's my favorite movie. I, and that I, time I yeah. was only dating, and I dating Leo and I had gone up to Washington where they were shooting just to visit and Jonathan put me on a plane with Dean Paul Martin yeah, Jr. and so we sat next to each other the whole flight up to Washington and then had breakfast together and and um, what a delightful guy um, but he was the kind of guy like we were sitting at breakfast he was sending back his toast was not toasted enough and then he, my coffee's cold and uh, my eggs are too runny. And I mean, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's uh, part of being a big movie star son, I guess. I don't know. Uh, picky. But he turned yeah. out to be charming. Then I was so sad to hear that, um, you know, he, how he passed away. He was flying a jet. Yeah, it's, it, it's, yeah, it's he was married, sad. He was then married to, um, wasn't Dorothy Hamill? It was the girl that played the original Romeo and Juliet. I forgot her name. But they had come, they had, she had their son with her, and to just watch Daddy get into the jet and fly off. Mm-hmm. And he never came back. I mean, he just ran into a mountain. I know he was married to Olivia Hussey and then Dorothy yeah, Hamill. Olivia Hussey, yes, thank you. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, it's, it's funny that movie is called Night of the Demon because there was a, a Night of the Demons that, that came out years later and had, had a trilogy of, of horror movies of that, coincidentally. But um, what, what, was that experience, uh, was, that, was that good overall? Uh, it seemed very unprofessional compared to what I had been doing. I was kind of doing it just as a favor. Someone asked me, you know, I was studying yeah. acting. And I thought, okay, well, let's, let's do this. And, you know, it was one of those things where I had to wake up and find out that um, my husband was in trouble with, you know, the, the Bigfoot yeah. and, uh, and all that or whatever that was. I never really understood the movie. Um, <laughs> uh, and it, it, it turned into a lot of different movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has different names. Is that what you're talking about, probably? Yeah, they, they yeah. kind of morphed it into other, other movies. Yeah. But, you know... Filmmakers do what they have to do to, you know, some people take the um, route of film festivals. They enter the film festival. If they win an award, they get a certain amount of recognition. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I don't fault anybody for, you know, doing whatever. But um, that was not one of my best experiences. But, um, I'm sorry. I wasn't even surprised to see that surface. So those are the two things. Like, I mean, um, Phantasm and Night of the Demon were really early on in my career and low low budget and I just but that's the strength of horror movies yeah we have
have a we have a production company now, and we like Gotti was our movie. We we produced Hotel Impossible, which was Travel Channel picked up with mm-hmm. Anthony Papiori, um, a guy that goes in and fixes up hotels, you know, small boutique hotels. Right. Can't compete with the big. I don't know if you ever saw it, but it went for eight seasons. I. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, no, I like producing. I like I've been directing theater now because I spend so much time on the stage that I know so much about the theater that I um, love to direct. And my daughter is a writer, so I directed one of her plays in Hollywood oh. stage. And yeah, I like. I guess I like being in charge, Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like being in charge, and to have my own recording studio at 21 years old. I mean that that was. Pretty, pretty cool. That, that is pretty yeah, amazing. What my love was, if we were going to be recording our music, because we had original music, I, I think it could have worked. But when, you know, when you just have to rent it out because there's no other way, you got to pay for this incredible equipment. And then it became just a business and not really where my passion lied. So mm-hmm. even though we weren't married, it was like a divorce. So it was like, who gets the piano and who gets the microphones and... You know, we had to kind of, but I let him keep most everything. I just wanted something where I could perform if I needed to perform. And then I got recording time. And right. I ended up having a band called the Blues Mothers when my kids were in school. I read that, yeah. <laughs> you know, we came together as, because it was an annual hmm. carnival, and one of the mothers was a short um, redhead. And I'm this tall blonde, and we thought, well, what can we do that's going to be funny and fun and we thought, so I think the Blues Brothers, the Blues Mothers, well, she looks like John Belushi, and I could be like <laughs> Dan Aykroyd, and we dressed, dressed in suits and hats and uh, saying, I'm a woman, and, uh, you know, down the stairs and daddy's all star joint, they got a jukebox that goes do it, do it. And we just had a ball. And then we started getting um, other kind of uh, events that we would play at, parties, uh, fundraisers, you know, so, yeah. and then uh, we recorded. And it so happens that the school that my kids went to was right in Studio City. So we had a lot of entertainment people that went there. And so um, it was pretty phenomenal. So, you know, the famous John Williams? Oh, yes, uh, uh, Star Wars. His baby brother, Don Williams, was our musical director. Wow. He, he had a. a a kid in the same grade as mine and we got to know each other and he, he knew all the musicians and so when we went into Paul's studio to record so I could use this recording time that he owed me I had Don Williams with me Nice. and the same guy that played um, on Ricky Lee Jones track mm-hmm. was Don's friend he was in the studio with us so he had a whole host of just incredible studio musicians that, uh, I mean, professional, you know, mm-hmm. really cool. So how, so how did the long association with Jonathan Kaplan begin? Um, it started with Heart Like a Wheel. And when I, they flew me up with uh, Dean Paul Martin, it was because of Leo. Leo made that introduction. And that's my favorite movie that Leo has done. Yeah, I just... Movie. I just, I think Bonnie Bedelia is great in it. I heard Sher- Shirley Muldowney was not pleased with her when she met her on set and whatever, but I like it. I think it was so undervalued and underrated by the studio. I, I just she ended love up liking it. Bonnie. And I remember being on the set and they were talking, the two of them. At, and so I was seeing them from the backs and they mm-hmm. looked like the same person. Because they had, <laughs> Donnie, uh, Bonnie Bedelia is like a chameleon. She can play anything oh yeah and so you know she has to kind of spend time with Shirley to get her rhythms and to you know find out who she is and so that she can play her so they did spend a lot of time together but I I thought that uh, Shirley was pleased with what she had what she did I thought she did a good job it was Uh, fantastic yeah and I like how he gave a part to Dick Miller because uh, Jonathan Kaplan was one of Roger Corman's protégés, and so like a lot of Roger Corman's protégés would put Dick Miller in their mainstream movies yeah. when when they made it, which, which I yeah. thought was so cool. Like, yeah, you've done your homework. That's right. That's right. I mean, because I know Leo was in Grand Theft Auto. Yes. Yes. 
Yeah, I, I talked to Peter Isaacson and Paul Link about that movie. I love that movie so much. Yes, yes. And um, I'm trying to think of the director. Oh. Well, Ron Howard directed Grand Theft Auto. No, the one that works with uh, Scorsese. Scorsese. And uh -huh. um, yeah. so, so Jonathan, uh, Scorsese taught at NYU when Jonathan went there. Jonathan Kaplan went to NYU to learn to be a director. Right. And Scorsese was one of his uh, mentors. Right. He also mentored Billy Crystal there. And somebody I interviewed recently, I can't remember who, but... Um, yeah, I know it's, it's weird. Back then, there was no internet. Everybody knew each other. Everybody ran in the same circles. It's bizarre how that yes. changed. Yeah, so I remember visiting on the set of Analyze This, mm -hmm. and Billy Crystal had just hosted the Oscars, and he was so good. It was like, you know, we hadn't had anybody so good before. And so I, I just got out of the uh, car, and he was walking towards me. Mm -hmm. And I went up to him and I said, oh, Billy, so great to meet you. I love you. And he goes, well, kiss me then because I've been kissing Italian men all day. And do you remember the scene in Analyze This where he's in the church or something and all these Italian men, you know, he's like sitting there because he's the psychologist. He's right. not a mafia guy. And right. all these Italian men are like kissing at me and kissing at me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a funny yeah, movie. And, and you let me, well, kiss me, because I've been kissing Italian men all day. It's pretty funny. Do you have a story about uh, Immediate Family? Immediate Family was another one of those things. So when you're on Jonathan Kaplan's list, if he needs anything, you say yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's right. voiceover. And it was just, um, you know, um, Glenn Close is in that movie. James Woods. Yes, James Woods. And so it was just a voiceover. But, um, I, you know, if my, any of my friends need me that are in the business, yeah. you know, I'm there. So uh, Bobby Moresco, I don't know if she saw Tenth and Wolf with Giovanni Ribisi and James Marsden. I've heard of it. Uh, uh, yeah, so I was his assistant on that movie because, um, you know, he needed somebody. Nice. Um, the Nail was another one that we produced. Um, that was in Philly, a, a low-budget movie about the story of Joy Nord Nordone, who was a, a professional boxer that went to prison. And when he got out, he was way overweight. Mm -hmm. But he lives in the same building as this kid who has a very abusive father. And he's kid, kids getting beat. So he teaches the kid how to fight. And uh, so that's what that movie's about. Interesting. But, um, let's see... I'm trying to see what we've missed here. When you do, when you do the conventions, like, do you enjoy doing them? Like, you know, can they get tiring after a while for you? Uh, I tell you, it kind of goes fast because people are so warm and wonderful, and they have their stories to tell. You know, mm -hmm. like I've been watching this movie every year since I was a little kid, and I still love it, and. Um, yeah, it's really the fans that make it that make it nice, and also all the people that the celebrities—they're great. Yeah, you know, it does get tiring because you're just you know you're out there, um, and you're kind of on like the whole time. Uh, so I sleep well at night, and then I'm ready to go the next day. You know, and you, when you figure you come in on a Friday, yeah, and you come in at, at five o'clock at night, and it's a short night. Saturday is the long. The whole the whole day, you know, mm -hmm. and then there's a party Saturday night that you know, we need to attend, <clears throat> and then Sunday's a half a day. So nice. it's quite a haul, though. I mean, when Leo and I did one in Philly, and then we were gonna, we'd always wanted to go to Martha's Vineyard, so we thought, <laughs> well, this will be great because we'll have the cash, you know, because you get all cash, you get paid in cash, but we. We really did well, so we had like so much cash that we wanted to take it to a bank. Nice. Uh, <laughs> so we, we, but then Leo was like, "They're gonna think we robbed a bank or something." <laughs> what if they call the cops and check it? I said, "Well, whatever it is, let's just go deposit it." And you know, they we we told the the uh, teller what, what we were thinking, and she laughed and she said, "Well, you don't." 
don't look like bank robbers, so, you know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. But, uh, but it is a fun way to make cash in a short amount of time. It is. You know? You know? And the pictures just keep going up. And the other guys, and now they've not, how do they get our address? We have fans now that send us pictures to sign and send back to them. And I don't know how we're, how they got our address. I, there's ways. Yeah, that that boggles my mind when I hear people ask the same thing. It, it's I I you know when I was a kid, I sent a couple fan letters to the um, the VHS company of the movie I loved, thinking that that was their address. You know, I never got a hold of anyone's address and sent them a, a fan letter. It just boggles my mind how people find this out. You know. Well, as long as they don't show up at our door, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard those stories too. Those those are scary. <laughs> yeah, well, we had, we lost somebody years ago. One of our actor friends who answered her door, and there was a fan there that just shot her. Remember? That oh yeah. Rebecca, yeah, Rebecca. Rebecca Schaefer. Yeah, yeah. Awful. Yeah. So now we get to my favorite part of the show. This is the secret silly game. And this, and this is a series of silly slumber party questions. It's no win or lose. It's just pure fun. And how the game works is I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me that exact same question, and I answer it. And feel free to comment on the answers, because they might be funny. Okay. So I'm going to be totally honest here with my answers. Yes. And they may not be funny. I don't know. Let's go. Lynn, are you ticklish? Yes. Oh, God. Yes, yeah, in fact, even just mentioning that word makes me. Ah! <laughs> yep. Okay, ready? Yep. Mommy, are you ticklish? Yes, if, but if you tickle me without warning, I might hit you in the groin. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is uh, is your belly button an innie or an outie? That's an innie. Okay. That's all I have to say about that. And Tommy. Is your belly button an innie or an outie? It is also an innie. Uh, what color are your toenails painted? Right now they're sparkly. Love sparkly, it. Silver and gold and white sparkles. Yep. And I did that for just a party I was going to, and now I'm tired of it, so I want to get rid of it. <laughs> what color are your toes painted? As of last night, uh, four of my toes are orange and one is black. You want to explain that? It's, it's, it's the Halloween season, so why not go oh. Halloween? <laughs> got it, got it. Okay. Are you going to put little eyes and a nose and a mouth on it? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I've never done that. I've been painting my toenails since I was 13. Oh, good. Just at Halloween or all the time? All the time. All the time. But different colors all the time? Yeah. I like I change them up like each month and stuff. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I, I know. A good pedicure is a good thing. I finally got Leo to come get a pedicure with me, and now it's a regular thing. Oh, I used to take dates uh, to the salon when I was in my 20s, so I totally get it. Um, what uh, What would you say is your best personality trait? I would say my best personality trait is acceptance of everyone just as they are. Love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how about you, Tommy? I have empathy, and I have no filter. Mm, mm -hmm. I'm a Gemini. <laughs> yeah. Good. That's a good combination. Because if you've got empathy, that means you're not going to say anything that's going to hurt anybody too badly. Because you're empathetic. Mm -hmm. But when I'm with like-minded people, then I let it rip. <laughs> okay, but, but then it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then my favorite question, is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? Um, I think, like, ooh, rotten food, yeah. or, like, something that's gone bad. Yeah. <laughs> How about you? Either farts or feet. Oh, yeah, that can be bad, but, but sometimes it's not that bad, but yes, it can be bad. I've got my mom's, my, my mom being Italian, I got her sensitive, her sensitive nose, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, 
it's so it's so true that the Italian thing because I know Leo has a better nose than I do. Like if if there's something really bad, I, I go, honey, what do you think about this? I make him smell. <laughs> 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 So October 18th through the 20th, um, you and the Phantasm crew will be at Scarefest in Lexington, Kentucky, and I hope it's a it's huge our 45th 40, anniversary. So it's 45th. A, Can you believe it's been 45 years? No, I can't. And um, they're going to do a whole, you know, shoot with all of us together. So it's going to be, be a big photo op. They're going to have interview us all. I mean. The person who now has bought Scarefest is he's new to Scarefest. It was a franchise that went before, and now this new guy has taken over. And he is a huge Phantasm, original Phantasm fan. So he's the one that's making this all happen. And um, I asked, I said, you know, my husband was in Halloween too. She says, well, we're not doing Halloween, but. I said, well, people like to see us together. She said, well, let me, let me talk to my boss. And, so Leo's coming. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And so is Dick Warlock, so they'll have, they'll just have each other. Usually Leo's with Lance Guest and the director Rick Rosenthal. I love Lance Guest, he's a great guy. He is, and he's great. Yeah. He's, he's so just who he is. He just never tries to impress anybody, he just is who he is, you know? Yeah, him and his whole Actors Gang crew that he uh, he he knew back in the day, they've been so nice to me, so supportive of me. They're good people. Well, that's good. It's very good. So I'm going to listen to some more of your um, interviews now that I know you, and um, I hope that we get to see you at some point at one of our events. Um, I, I hope so. It. I hope and so. You're in, you're in Modesto. I'm in Modesto, yes. Yes. Okay. And I hope I hope you guys have just an absolute blast. Even though I can't be there in in Lexington, but we will stay in touch. And you have yourself a great rest of your day and be safe out there. Great. And thanks again for having me. And um, I look forward to meeting you live and in person at some point. Absolutely. Okay. Take care, Tommy. Take care, Lynn. Bye bye. Well, there you have it. Lynn Eastman Rossi, ain't she a sweetheart? Oh my God, what a sweet, classy lady. Loves to talk, and I'm so glad that we got to have this time together. And, you know, I met everybody at the 40th. You know, who knows? Maybe I'll meet somebody at the 46th last year when I act, I mean, next year when I actually, you know, get to travel again, hopefully. Well, until next time, there's, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes!